at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. (laughs) Fair enough. All right, guys. Hey, listen, thanks so much for joining uh, this week's XY Live. Um, As always, we will encourage you to ask as many questions as possible, so we will be monitoring those as... uh, as the session goes through. This week, we've got Executive Director of Traced of Financial Life Management, Mark Nagel, to join us. Uh, Mark's got many, um, I, I suppose, polarizing opinions around the industry. Um, being a little bit more uh, honest with itself, I guess, as it looks into the mirror, uh, creating uh, stronger uh, business models that create really fantastic uh, 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 value propositions to clients. Uh, Mark's uh, now, I suppose, pretty well renowned talking at a whole bunch of industry circuits. Uh, he's a, a, a pretty consistent uh, contributor in, in media press and the like. Um, and with that, Mark, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ray. And uh, yeah, thank you all to those who've taken some time out to join us. Um, so I think, Mark, uh, we I might sort of start by asking uh, the, well, I guess why we've got the topic today, uh, leaving value on the table um, and, and perhaps ask that you maybe uh, explore that a little bit more and explain uh, what you mean by, by, by that. Yeah, sure. Um, look, everybody would be aware of our, uh, you know, industry stats that suggest, uh, you know, something close to 80% of our potential audience don't access the services Uh, of a financial advisor. We also know that there are statistics in Australia that suggest uh, large areas of the population are not confident about their ability to self-fund retirement. So I think there's potential around that inconsistency for for our industry. Clearly, there are a lot of people that need our help that are not currently accessing our help. And I think the industry needs to Um, you know, take a long, hard look at itself and understand why so many people um, don't engage with us. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Jackie, if if you're there, Mark um, sent through a little bit earlier, everybody, uh, I guess a a, a traditional advice model, which we thought, uh, I guess, to to take from Carl Richards, uh, the sketch guy, um, it, often it's easy to draw these things out as we explain them. So, Matt, Mark, would you perhaps like to talk through what this uh, what this means? Yeah, I think it's important to uh, understand the history of our industry and where it's come from. And I think that that helps give us context in terms of why um, so many people don't access our services. Um, you know, it's possible that we're not being heard, but it's far more likely that what we have to offer isn't resonating with clients, either through experience, um, perception, or reputation. Um, And I think that the the traditional licensee models have uh, really driven um, some of this behavior, and I've tried to put it together in a sketch here. So often um, the bulk licensees have been product-driven. They've used the licensee framework for distribution of their products. that basically has resulted in compliance issues. So a lot of the issues that we have seen in our industry have uh, have basically stemmed from the fact that licensees have been trying to push product through those channels. And then of course, best interest duties, et cetera, et cetera, um, are tested. So those compliance um, issues have essentially driven compliance driven processes. Um, Now that's great to protect the licensee, but it actually delivers a poor client experience. So if we're product centric and we have a poor client experience, we land up with an unattractive value proposition. Uh, one of the things I know Mark and I have spoken about offline, everybody is, uh, you know, some of the things that we're capturing in, in fact finds. Mark, if perhaps uh, you'd, you'd like to, to talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, when we think about those um, processes, I mean, essentially, uh, again, you know, with the licensee model, a lot of the technology and the advice models that are handed down by licensees are primarily to protect the license. They're not about your business or, more importantly, your clients. So 
that's where you have a disconnect. Um, and I think that that needs to be addressed as a primary before we can start to evolve as an industry. Now, we're kind of seeing some changes, you know, and we've seen this sort of recent, um, the, you know, the recent legislation around the education. Now, I, I don't actually think that that's great, um, but it will help with lowest common, on, lowest common denominator advice models. And what I mean by that, if you're licensing a hundred advisors, your compliance regime is aimed at the worst one of those hundred advisors. So the advisor that is more risky in terms of the advice that he delivers, he's the one that has to be controlled by the processes, which means that the other 99, regardless of how good or bad they are, relative to that hundredth person, are governed by the same processes and procedures. And that can lead to very restricted engagement uh, with your clients because of the process that you're forced to follow. Is it your sense, uh, I suppose, speaking to uh, business owners and, and the like, that, that we're starting to see, and without getting into a, an institution versus independent conversation, but are you starting to find that uh, smaller business owners are starting to get frustrated by being stuck with a compliance process that's designed for the, for the number of 100th advisor and 100th uh, licensee? Is, are, you, are you sort of seeing that, that, that being a, a motivator for, for the independence wave? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, our own experience was exactly that. So, you know, uh, having shaken off a licensee that had that, you know, multiple advisor model, um, we've been able to evolve what we do in terms of the way that we deliver advice to clients in, in a very dramatic way. Now, that doesn't mean that we're any less compliant. In fact, I would argue that we're significantly more compliant because now, when it comes to the Know Your Client regulations, I think we know a lot more about our clients through our process now than we ever did with a, with a standard fact find that came out of our licensee, um, which is, as you very well know, constricted to the collection primarily of financial details. When I say we're leaving value on the table, the value that we're leaving on the table is all of the good stuff. So all of the value. So the reason that our industry is being disrupted at the moment, both by technology and legislators and regulations, is because of the history that we've had. So we've developed essentially a fairly lazy value proposition with admittedly high margins, which has been part of the problem because those high margins have not exactly been uh, a driver for the incumbent in the, the incumbents in the industry to drive change. Um, you know, so the legislators have moved in. Uh, and the technology's moved in because they know that they can grab our lazy um, value propositions and they can look at those high margins. And both of those things are now forcing change upon our industry. So now we don't have a choice. We always had a choice. We chose not to take it. Um, but, but now, you know, we, we, we're forced to have a choice because that traditional model just simply will not survive. And for you younger advisors um, out there, you know, if you want to, if you want an industry in 10 or 20 years time, um, that traditional model is dead and buried. And if you follow that, you simply will not have a business. To be, I suppose, devil's advocate, um, Phil and I were speaking offline, and I think this is something that probably resonates with a lot of advisors, and perhaps it's a good uh, lead into the, the, the next slide that we're going to see. But if you're a young advisor and you're starting out and you get all that stuff and you actually do really want to help people and you, and you understand uh, I, I guess the, the importance of uh, good, valuable, objectives-based planning, but you struggle to uh, uh, have a commercial business model through doing the right thing because, you know what, unfortunately, if you're in your, your late 20s, you just don't have those hundreds of thousands of dollars that, uh, that can justify a percentage of funds under management, nor perhaps uh, justify a $5,000 SOA fee. Um, so, you know, did, would you have any comments for the younger advisors who perhaps understand and get and get that, but are struggling to make any money uh, to, to, you know, survive for tomorrow? Yeah, I do. I think that there's, I think there's some good news and I think there's some less good news. And we'll start with the less good news. I think that technology needs to evolve and tools need to evolve to support advisors that are trying to do their job in a different way. So the tools that we have in the industry clearly have been developed around that traditional um, model. So there are infinite tools that you can go to to drive and support that model. And there are far less tools available to drive a modernised model, which we'll have a look at in a moment. 
Um, but, you know, technology and tools at some point will catch up and, you know, then we're going to be able to deliver scalable solutions to people that don't necessarily have funds under management. So, you know, once again, anybody that's relying on revenue with a funds under management model at some point is going to be challenged around that. Probably seeing the beginnings of it. Um, it's a long way. I think there's some, some, some distance to go with that one. So I don't think that that's a revenue stream that's threatened in the short term. But I think in the medium to long term, again, you know, modern advice businesses, if they're looking forward 10, 15 years, they really need to start thinking that that's a revenue stream that will gradually become less important and we will have to rely on revenue streams that are generated by other areas of advice. Um, you know, there's plenty of online investment solutions which don't need an advisor fee added to them to necessarily give a good outcome to the client. Um, so I think that there are some challenges, but, you know, I don't think we should miss the fact that some of these traditional models have not been particularly scalable. So, you know, we've got a lot of advisors out there that have been, you know, trying to add value by running their own portfolios and have been trying to deliver bespoke portfolios to clients. Really difficult to scale a business like that. You know, it's paperwork intensive, it's people intensive. Um, so I think that, you know, we will have the opportunity to put together some very lean business models going forward. And I think that, you know, we need to think about what part AFSL plays in future businesses. Now, I think that there will always be a requirement around that for some elements of advice and product-related advice. But I think we're going to be far less reliant on the AFSL framework to be giving and delivering really great lifestyle, more broad-based advice to our clients. Kind of interested in the idea, um, obviously goals are so subjective in that, you know, uh, with, with an investment portfolio, you can pull them into five groups and that's how you can perhaps talk to your clients. But with goals, it's literally each person, not even each household, each person within the household. Um, so perhaps, Jackie, if we open up the next slide, I know Mark's got some views on how to create uh, scalable objective space um, uh, advice models. Um, I think we're looking at one side of it, so won't. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get the let's get the whole picture, so we're not yeah <laughs> not standing on our heads. But yeah, essentially, um, you know what we're going to see now is my view of a, I guess a modernised um, advice model, um, where we really do bring the client back to the centre. And if you bring the client back to the centre, um, you're going to create better engagement. And if every advisor that's kind of listening to this thinks about their own experiences we all know very well that the goals uh, are out the, be the best goals that we kick are when we deliver um, lifestyle driven outcomes for our clients you know it's really about a, a whoopee moment re related to a, an investment success it's it's much more of where you've helped them with their lives so if we start by collecting data that's values driven so if we shift our focus from collecting merely financial data to values-driven data, we can have a process that's client-focused. And because that's client-focused, that in itself becomes more engaging for the person at the other end. So I'm kind of interested in running statistics at some point around a typical first meeting with an advisor and a new potential client. And my view, and again, and this is a view that's supported by other advisors I've spoken to, we have a sense that the advisor does around 75% of the speaking in that first meeting. Now, that can't be right because when the client's leaving, that is not an experience that's been about them. It's been about the advisor or the advisor's business. So a values-driven process actually turns that on its head and we can create a process that is 75% about the client and 25% about the advisor facilitating that discussion. And if you can put all that together, you, you land up with a very strong and attractive value proposition because it's all about the client and their lives and it's not about your licensee's compliance. But in essence, you've created a more compliant model because you know your client more thoroughly than you ever would through a traditional fact find. I quite, I quite like the notion, um, 
that, that we discussed previously about uh, a traditional fact find because of the litigious framework that we operate in under the traditional advice models captures the, uh, the assets, the liabilities, the income, the expenses, the insurances. So you've captured somebody's balance sheet and you've taken that out of the office and given it to client services, what you've actually left in the boardroom is the person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you've kind of left, I, I guess, what this model picks up, which is uh, who's, who sits behind uh, those, those numbers that, you, that the advisors collected. Yeah, look, I think that, that you framed that very well, Ray. I mean, you do literally leave the person in the room. And I think that, again, that's why we lose potentially 80% of our audience, because the 20% may be recognised that there's a specific issue that they need to have resolved and that drives them into advice, um, such as the investment of money. Um, but this is really all about helping clients make better financial decisions throughout their lives and capturing people at a younger age to help them have a more successful life, which is supported by finance, clearly, but it's not divorced from it. Um, so just fixing the money side of things can be obviously a great assistance and financial security is at the core of well-being but there's an awful lot of other things that go into well-being and if advisors can help clients around some of those other things I think you just strengthen your value uh, proposition dramatically and sometimes this is outside of, I, um, of the AFSL framework so you know, when you go back to cost to serve, Ray, which is something that I think we're all struggling with to some extent, you know, because we're outside of that uh, licensing framework, you know, there's the opportunity to, live, to deliver one to many, for example. And we're seeing some of those evolutions occurring in healthcare, um, where in the US there is now one to many solutions for healthcare, which is driving down the costs and is making that healthcare accessible to people that it otherwise would not have been accessible to. How does that work? Um, well, the healthcare model, I'm, I've not dived inside it particularly, but essentially, you know, you're putting, instead of having a one-on-one -on -one with a GP, for example, you're putting a GP in a room with 20 people. 19 or 20 of them would be interacting with technology, and the others would be consulting that GP one-on-one -on -one incidentally over a period of a couple of hours during that session. So now that's evolving, it's something that's brand new, but it's something that um, our, um, we sent uh, our operations, uh, our head of operations over to the London School of Business recently. And as a business solution, this is something that multiple industries are looking at to reduce the cost to serve. Um, and I think it's something that the financial services industry could learn a lot from. We can, you know, our industry is not just our industry, but as a country, we've often failed at increasing financial literacy through the population for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think that there is an opportunity to serve one to many until technology catches up um, so that we can actually deliver financial uh, literacy much more effectively using technology. So, Mark, um, just for everyone watching, uh, there's questions going out in the uh, chat box. We're going to put them to Mark uh, after Ray and I finish drilling Mark on his um, ideas. So, yeah, keep throwing out questions. But my question is, with that modern advice model, modernised advice model that you've got, how do we um, make it values-driven, really personal, um, but you're also talking about one-to-many? Are they just diametrically opposed? Look, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think I'm talking about the same thing when I mention one-to-many and values-based advice. Um, I guess what I'm talking about is that there is a gap, as Ray mentioned. The cost to serve is, a, is, a, is an issue that the industry is facing at this point in time. You know, we're having, uh, we're having to face probably increased costs and we're having our revenue streams attacked by regulation. So those two things are having an impact in, in, in cost to serve. We've seen it play out in the UK where a huge number of people dropped out of advice because of regulation forcing the cost to serve up significantly. And I'm suggesting that one to many might be a solution in the short term for that cost to serve issue. And I think it's something our industry should seriously look at. Would we go back to the values-based advice, I think that at this point in time, I'm really talking about that as a one-on-one -on -one relationship replacing the traditional advice model. Um, I think that the two at some point, you know, will come together. Um, 
but at this point I'm really separating and spitting the atom there Phil and I'm saying look the traditional advice model is gone if you're following that it's going to die the business is likely to, to die with it um, so you need to evolve and whether it's that modernized um, advice model that I've put together or something else that you've come up with uh, in your own businesses um, either way that traditional advice model is redundant and it needs to be replaced with a values based model you're just collecting or focusing on a different data set from the outset so you're finding I mean you know in a we have an obligation as you know to record pretty much in the client's own words what their key objectives are for going to see an advisor that's a really difficult thing for a client to do sometimes and mm. You know, you often see the kind of rabbit caught in the headlights when you pose that question in the traditional sense. So having a, uh, a, a psych-based process which helps you help the client to explain what's important to them, both from fin financial uh, aspect and also from a lifestyle aspect, if you can do that and help to free the wheels of that conversation, the data that you collect from that is very valuable. And if you think about your business, the most valuable thing in your business is usually your people. And the second most valuable thing in your business is the data that you collect. And the way that you then regurgitate and use that data to grow your business and create better experiences for your clients. And leaving value on the table is you leave all that good stuff. So I know advisors that have amazing conversations with their clients, but you look at what they've collected from the interview and it's just a bunch of facts about their superannuation and insurance. Mm. All the good stuff has gone. And it may or may not get revisited, but it's not being recorded and it's not being used to service that client. So a traditional review focuses on the investment piece, the insurances, superannuation, whatever it might be. The lifestyle piece has been completely left behind. And I think that that's a great shame. And I think that that's, uh, that's been a huge shortcoming um, in the advice industry. And I think it's uh, one of the major reasons that the 80% are switched off from what we do. Yeah, so for me, with the traditional advice model, um, because most people are, are, are licensed through vertically integrated licensees, do you think that that can change moving away from products when really, let's be honest, call a spade a spade, the licensees who are owned by vertically integrated businesses, they are there to distribute products. They call the BDMs distributions, um, they call their advisors their distribution team, let's be honest. So, yeah. so how do we move away from this product focus um, when we've still got this vertical integration? Should we all be moving towards self-license like yourself? Oh, look, I, I think that self-licensing is absolutely the way to go. I think the bulk licensing, uh, we are seeing, you know, there are um, more modernised licensees that are shifting away from pro being product-centric. So when I, you know, I'm not, there are, there are good licensees that are trying to do different things. And I'm, I'm kind of not saying that all licensees equal, you know, Mr. Evil. Um, but a lot of them have been product centric. Um, and whilst they remain product centric, it's really difficult to create a process that doesn't need compliance wrapped around it to kind of shrink that and protect the licensee from being sued because they're trying to distribute product. I think you do that by actually creating a service offering that changes where it's focused. Um, so yeah, you, you're always going to need product solutions, but the product solutions really aren't the big deal. You know, a, a good investment service, a good robust investment service is not going to dictate the outcomes of the client over a period of time. You're going to do that by interacting with them and helping them make consistently better financial decisions over time. You're going to do that by helping a husband and wife interact more cohesively as a financial team and maybe even stop a divorce that has not yet happened, you know, because of financial stress. That's a good outcome, you know. Try a financial, try and calculate the financial return on the divorce that didn't happen mm -hmm. relative to marginal differences in investment returns, for example. So I think the product thing with a good advice model just shrinks so far into the background really doesn't matter which products you're using as long as they're satisfying that very small component of the client needs yeah uh, yeah i totally agree i've got uh two more questions before we head over to the audience questions uh, and they're they're um they're probably webinars in and of themselves um so <laughs> let's let's try and keep it short um but given your uh, modernized advice model 
none of it talks about products and we've discussed that products makes such an insignificant difference in the um, client's lives. Do you, and given that the regulatory guides um, talk about SOAs as, um, they're all product focused providing SOAs. Do you think uh, the modernized advice model can move away from providing SOAs at scale to clients and therefore reducing significant costs? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's very possible to industrialize the values-based process, which spits out something that is not necessarily a statement of advice. So if you are not requiring products or uh, other advice solutions that require a statement of advice under AFSL, it will be possible to create a document that's highly valuable for a client. Hmm. Even if they're tapping into other financial solutions, such as a robo advisor for an investment piece, for example. So, you know, rather than we might, you know, reframe that term, it's not really a robo advisor, they're just using an internet provider of investment services. That might be an example. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely think that, that the atom will be split and I think that there'll be convergence everywhere. So, you know, accountants, for example, are facing the same pressures around transactional revenue that we are. They're going to have to move more into the advice world. Um, so I think that there will be some convergence around coaching generally. Um, but I think that advisors are really well placed to, to steal that space. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. Um, the the last question is around the cost and the eighty percent of uh, Australians seeking advice. Do we do you believe that it's really the um, the lack of um, advisors talking about the client's values that's um, stopping people from getting advice, or is it simply the cost? Like you know, people are throwing around four grand, five grand for upfront SOAs when the average Australian saving four hundred and twenty dollars per month as a household. Like we're talking about 10 months or 12 months worth of savings just to pay for that initial advice. So do you think it is advisors aren't talking clients language or do you think it's mainly down to the cost of advice? Oh, look, I think it's both. Um, you know, the 20%, you know, doesn't consist of the richest 20%. Uh, it, you know, that 80, 20 is not split along wealth lines. There's an element of that in there. Absolutely. For sure. I understand that but that's not the be all and end all of it. Um, and there's certainly, you know, people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale that are not going to access our services. So, you know, we're not aiming at the 100% here, but 20% is a number that can be, I think, doubled or even trebled. And I think that the cost to serve does need to come down. So we do, that, that definitely is a, an issue that we need to address. I think one to many in technology, now, there's no doubt that the future advisor is going to be servicing a whole lot more clients numerically than he does today. But that advisor might look very different from the AFSL-centric advisor that we see today. So you know, and technology needs to come in and help. You know, I think the, the numbers being banded about in the US is that the average advisor is going to have to service up to 800 clients, not only without any perceivable service degradation, but actually with service enhancement. Hmm. So those those are challenges that we that we all face, and you know we do need to uh, rely on people in technology and fintech to help us um, reduce the cost to serve. And I am really, you know, when I sort of uh, think about some of the younger Australians, I would love to be able to you know get to them in their twenties and early thirties to stop some of the mistakes happening before you know before it's too late and behaviours be set. You know, and all of those sorts of things. So um, we, we do need to find ways of doing that. And I think that, you know, there is some opportunity around that one to many to, to think about how uh, our industry can start to service using a slightly different business model, a, a business model that's evolved to reduce cost to serve. Yeah, I don't even have 800 Facebook friends, let alone <laughs> friends that I know intimately and I know their values. Um, so that's well. When your Facebook well. friends get into double figures, Phil, check back in. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the, I'm just trying to get yeah above ten. So, yeah, that's right, mate. I know. I keep my eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to head over to uh, audience questions. Raj, you start us off. Yeah, cool. So I'll start at the top. Uh, Benjamin Marsh and asked the, the first question. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, asking about whether or not anyone's had luck uh, getting licensees to be more open, improving fact find documents to be 
uh, more about client goals. And that kind of feeds into the quest, uh, second question from Ben Nash, um, who talks about the idea that there's, it's actually a myth that, that clients won't pay uh, for objective space. But he was interested in understanding how you might collect uh, values-driven data. So I guess there's a two-in-one question for you. Yeah, I mean, I guess we have, uh, we, we've gradually evolved our fact find to include more lifestyle-based information. And the business has invested in um, bringing Salesforce as a CRM, which has much more functionality in its ability to collect that data and store it and then regurgitate it in a way that we can report on and, and use that you know, when we're servicing our clients. That's a challenge. Unfortunately, Salesforce is expensive to license and it's also expensive to customise to the individual requirements uh, of a business. And I think that, you know, again, as our industry evolves, we're going to see either licensees change the way that they bring together a service package for advisors, which has to be much more about providing advisors with a better set of tools to enable them to collect this data and then to actually, you know, be able to report on it, store it, and then use it in a different way. So the Tracer business now, for example, um, is able to use some personality profiling. So, you know, gone are the days where you segregate your database, gold, silver, and bronze, based on revenue that you collect. You know, God forbid, that's just ridiculously old school there's no value in it and if anybody's doing it I would suggest that you have a look at that and think about some alternatives but we now use um, some personas based in psychology which means that we can use different language when we communicate to different sets of our clients and I think that even smaller businesses can start to think about doing some of those things um, you know and gradually as technology um, does improve and as licensees start to provide better toolkits for their advisors, I think it's going to become easier. Um, but for now, I would urge you to look at your data form, think about how you can collect and have more lifestyle values-based conversations, and don't leave it on a notepad or an iPad. You know, Think about using the information that you've collected, think about how you can store it, and think about how you can use it to create a richer experience for the client. Yeah, I think uh, we had um, Vince Scully on. He's customised Salesforce and he said he dropped about a million dollars into that customization. So maybe that's not the solution for everyone. Um, so Mark, next question's from Mark Rottenstein. Um, I'm going to use a bit of creative license here, but he said, uh, the modern advice, <laughs> modernised advice model, uh, you're living in fairyland, Mark, because that's all good and well to collect values. But as soon as we start talking products, we need to go through that same traditional advice model, hitting compliance barriers. Um, so, how do we how do we do the modernised advice model, even though we still need to do product recommendations? Uh, yeah, I um, I kind of understand why that criticism could be levelled at that modernised advice model. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, there is no reason to get around the compliance aspect of of product related solutions when you're providing uh, an advice piece. What I'm arguing is that it should not become the thing that dominates the conversation with the client, the thing that dominates the way that you engage with the client. So yeah, absolutely, you will always need, um, you know, that, that statement of advice and the, the compliance that surrounds that is going to be there and that's not gonna get any easier and that's not gonna be relaxed, at least in the foreseeable future. In fact, you know, it's likely to harden. So. You know, but what you have to do is just shrink it. You know, don't let it be the dominant thing. Don't let it be the thing that controls your business. You know, create product solutions, but, you know, make sh it should be like less than 10% of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that you can really condense the SOA back down to what ASIC always meant it to be. You know, it wasn't meant to be a 100-page document. You can thank your licensees' lawyers for that. It's got nothing to do with the regulators. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, another one from Shane Mitchell. Uh, keen on your thoughts. Uh, any value in spending the uh, upfront cost over two years to smooth it out? What are your thoughts on perhaps using that as a uh, lowered uh, barrier to entry? 
Yeah, obviously you're running some business risk around that because you know you've got a you've got cash flow issues and b you've got to manage you know the ongoing collection of of the fees. So you've got to make sure that you're providing a service which uh, you know means that that client is going to be happy to pay that over that two year period. But yeah, I think it's it's one of many solutions that you can think about. So you know what I'm asking advisors to do is really think about that cost to serve and. And think about creating scalable businesses to begin with. So, you know, if you're running down rabbit holes of managing intricate cash flow, for example, and you're trying to deliver that as a cash flow, uh, sorry, as a value proposition, well, think about how you're going to scale that. So, you know, you might be able to deliver a great service to 10 or 15 or 20 clients, but will you be able to do that for 200 or 300 clients? And if you can't, don't run down that rabbit hole. So as you start to think about the way that you evolve your business model, always have one eye on scale because cost to serve is going to be an ever increasing difficulty in our industry. You know, we are going to have to provide our services at lower cost. And to do that, we need to have genuine scale within our businesses. So don't create complexity because there's rarely any value in it. And if you can remove complexity and deliver genuine value with scale, you should have a future-proof business. All right, next question is from James Miller. He said, do you think if we have a product-free, SOA-free business model, uh, and we call it financial coaching, can we do that without any need of qualification? So any Joe Blow can set up a business doing that? Uh, well, I'm not a compliance officer, so I'll, you know, I'll put a caveat around it that anybody thinking about doing that should go and speak to somebody that uh, specialises in that area. But on the face of it, you know, I would say, yeah, absolutely. You know, you can, um, one of the problems that you always drift into, of course, is that the moment you start having conversations that require financial solutions, without the licence, you almost drift back into life coaching arena or business coaching arena. And I think that some of the shortfalls that life coaches and business coaches have had is their inability to provide solutions because they're not licensed, which is why I think, uh, you know, the modern advisor has a really great opportunity to go in and grab that space um, because you can always have the AFSL in the background. What I'm saying is, you know, if you've got a team of three or four advisors, all of whom are licensed in the current business models, the future business might have one advisor that has the AFSL license and other advisors that are operating outside of that environment that tap on that advisor when, as and when is needed. Um, I think that that's much more likely to be the way um, advice businesses look in the future. The fact that you're not maintaining multiple licenses means that that business model is likely to be more cost effective, which again comes back and helps with that cost to serve. I think um, just before we wrap up, Phil, sorry to cut you off. I'm, I am uh, sort of midway through a psychology uh, coaching degree. And I think one of the things that I'm certainly learning in class is there's there's that fear that, that the term can be bastardised because there's no regulation around it. Um, you know, if, if any of you have gone to have a look for a business coach or a life coach or whatever it is, um, you know, you, you're almost you're almost subjected to the vagaries of a great uh, uh, landing page on a website, and, you, and it's, it's really difficult to find find out before it's too late because there is there is no no regulation in terms of calling you, even a counsellor. That was something that I'd learnt. Uh, obviously, clinical psychology is a term that uh, you can only call yourself if you've got the the ticks and the uh, certificates on the wall. But you can you can happily call yourself a counsellor. Um, and that, that's an unregulated, uh, unregulated thing as well. So I think, I think there's perhaps um, a discussion and, and, yeah, this is something that we could talk about for hours, but I think there's perhaps a, a conversation around quality assurance in, in that space as well and what that actually means and defining that. Well, you can actually call yourself a financial advisor as well and not be qualified, so... Um so that's more directly in our industry. Um, guys, we've got plenty of more questions, um, but we are going to have to wrap up here. Uh, we're going to take these questions to the Facebook page. So, Mark, I'm just going to make the presumption that you're going to jump and join in that Facebook group and answer some of those leftover questions when you've got the time. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And just wanted to thank AIA for supporting XY Live. Um, if you are on Facebook, which I presume everyone is, join the Facebook group. Um, there's amazing conversations happening every single day, every single hour, um, and the people are throwing out questions and getting answers from 
uh, advisors and experts in the area. So I encourage you all to join that. Um, and we will see you next week. We've got Steve Crawford joining us. Um, and so it's going to be a great session. So I just want to thank you again, Mark, for sharing us with us all your experience and knowledge. Uh, thank you and uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you. And just before everybody goes, uh, we are doing our XY Social in Sydney, uh, 30th of uh, March. So uh, we've booked the venue for that uh, in Sydney CBD and we'll be starting to c communicate to everybody what uh, uh, tickets and, and the like and, and the, uh, the content for the night. So uh, yeah, look forward to, to seeing you all then. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week.